Now 
Just a mention makes a way Giants fall
Lord, we offer these words to you in our very lives. Lord, to you, Lord, the desire of our heart, Lord, is to live sincere, devoted, committed lives to you. And Lord, as we worship you, Lord, I, I ask that, Lord, you would help us. Lord, help us to love you and to serve you like you love us and how you have served us, Lord, with all of your heart. Lord, we wanna be a people that are all in. We wanna be a people that are fully devoted, fully given to you, that, Lord, there'd be no area of our lives that is held back, that we keep you out of, but that, Lord, you would have full access to who we are as your people. Lord, it says that this is our acceptable act of worship. Lord, is to present our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Lord, we live, Lord, to bring honor to you. Lord, may the life of Jesus shine through our lives. Lord, may the words of Jesus come out of our mouths, Lord, to our neighbors and our community members. May the love of God, Lord, emanate from our lives as we put you first. Lord, as we look to you, as we behold you, Lord, would you change us in a greater way? Make us more like Jesus. Make us more like you. Lord, our desire, Lord, we know that we know many people, Lord, that don't know you, that don't understand you, that don't have a relationship with you. Lord, I ask that you would use our lives Lord, that we would be ambassadors just through the way we live our lives, through the way we speak. Lord, through the way that we are committed to you and committed to your ways, God. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, our friends, our family members, our coworkers, Lord, would be provoked, that they would look at our lives and they would see you, not us, they would see you, Lord, working in our lives. And that, God, you would have your way, that you would reach people even through our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Beautiful day. Oh man, I love it. I love it. It's so it's so good. I, I'm just enjoying the fall. We're having a good fall. And uh, is there such thing as a good fall? Is there? Yeah. Yeah. They're not here at least. Not at this elevation. Anyway, yeah, there's some snow up in the past, I'm sure, but we love it. It's beautiful. Well, guys, uh, just a couple things real quick before we get into the message and receive our offering. This Sunday is our goal to turn in our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. So if you brought a shoe box, um, feel free to put it in the back table there or by the sound booth, and we're going to collect these. And I just want to pray over these. Um, this is such an impactful outreach for children around the world. Um, one of the really cool things about uh, Samaritan's Purse, the ministry that's led by Franklin Graham, is they are so consistent in making sure that people have an opportunity, children have an opportunity to hear the gospel message. And uh, they present it in an age-appropriate context in sharing the need for Jesus and how Jesus came to save us of our sins and, and, and to give us the hope of heaven when we die. And it's just, it's a beautiful ministry. It's very, very impactful around the world. And I just wanna pray over our shoe boxes. And there are gonna be millions of shoe boxes that are gonna be sent out from America uh, to different parts of the world. And, and I just believe God's gonna use it greatly. And there's gonna be kids that are gonna become born again because of this outreach that we get to participate in, in a small little part that we do. And so let's pray. Can we pray for that? All right, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your great love for us that reached into our world and saved us. And Lord, as these uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes go out around the world, you know where the need is. You already have a place picked out for them to go. We, we ask that you would go before those shoe boxes and prepare the hearts of children around the world, Lord, to receive the life-giving message of Jesus. And uh, Lord, that you would use them, Lord, that Lord, in the hardest, darkest places, where the place where it seems like there's no heart or there's no hope, Lord, I pray that you would go into those places where it doesn't seem like there's hope and that the hope of Christ would shine bright in those areas. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them in Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Well, yesterday we had a volunteer appreciation event at the bowling alley. We had over 37 people come out, adults and children. And so it was just a ton of fun. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Obviously, there's some volunteers that weren't able to make it because of scheduling conflict. But we want to communicate our appreciation to all the volunteers. You guys are a great blessing. This church is what it is because of your service and your love for your church family. Ultimately, for our communities, we try to be a lighthouse. Uh, how many of you know the church should be a lighthouse? right? We're called to be a lighthouse. And so uh, when you received a bulletin today, um, and I, one of the things I've done, I realized that the, the new chairs don't have pockets on it. I'm working on that. There's an accessory we're going to uh, add on to the new chairs, um, but we included a giving envelope. Uh, that's not to be over the top and requesting giving, but it's just to create convenience for you um, until we get those pockets put in. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to the thing I wanted to highlight is I realize that there's been some people that uh, are newer attenders of the church. You may not have signed up for this, but we have a text notification service. And if you're interested on receiving text notifications and reminders and those types of things, there's a graphic in the center section of the bulletin that lets you know how to sign up. When you sign up, please let us know your name because what happens is I'll get a random phone number and it'll say, sign me up, but I don't know who it is. And uh, it would always help. Have you ever gotten those messages? Somebody texts you, they're on a first name basis with you and you have no idea who just sent you the message. Have you ever been there? Okay, so turn to your neighbor and say, don't be that guy. And, and so I wanna just, I wanna know who you are so we can communicate with you. Learning your name is important to me. And, uh, and so anyway, that's what it is. On the bottom of that same section, I took some time. I did this probably a month, month and a half ago. I'm a podcast guy. How many of you guys listen to podcasts? Yeah, I, I listen to podcasts. I'll listen to other preachers preach and marriage and family stuff and parenting podcasts and different, you know, like drive time during the week. I try to listen to stuff. I've put together just a condensed list of recommended resources uh, for you to maybe explore and take advantage of. They're free. You can subscribe to them and uh, just kind of like a shot in the arm in some of these areas of our lives that need attention. Um, you know, we, we, there's just so many areas that we can grow and become more like Jesus, and that's kind of the intent behind that. So um, this Wednesday, we're going to continue on with our midweek ministry. Um, we have youth group Wednesday night at 630, and then the adults, we will be finishing up the book of Romans. We have been on a long journey through the book of Romans, and uh, I've decided we're going to end Romans this week, and so we're going to cover the last few chapters of the book. It's going to be a great time before we launch into our next study. But at this time, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and we're going to receive our Sunday morning offering. You guys doing okay? You're a little quiet this morning. You guys are like, don't do that to me. I'm not, okay, let's pray. Lord, Lord, we love you. You're so good to us. You're such a good provider. And uh, so many things that we can look at and see areas of our life where you've cared for us. And, and uh, from the salmon that we catch in the summer to the berries that we harvest, to the groceries that we get at the grocery store, Lord, we're just reminded that you're our provider, and we thank you for that, Lord. And as we give today in our offering, we do it just as an expression of gratitude and thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give today. And while the, uh, the uh, offering plate's being passed by, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. So when I was a new believer, um, I started reading my Bible, and this story I'm going to share with you in Matthew 8, it charged me. I was so excited about the story, uh, and, and uh, the Lord really used this. And I remember uh, after I'd read the story in the Bible, going to church one Sunday, and the preacher preached the passage that I had read. Have you ever had those times where you read a passage of Bible, uh, a scripture pops up, and then you go to church, and they're talking about that very same thing? Have you ever had those experiences in your life? And you're kind of like, okay, God, I, I think you're speaking. I'm listening. I've heard this like two, three times, and it would be so funny because 
Sometimes I would get out of church and I would uh, turn on the radio and we were, I was a part of a charismatic Pentecostal church and we believed in the gifts of the spirit. And then I would turn on the Baptist guy who was, I viewed as being a little bit more conservative and he would be preaching the same passage that I just heard. And I just thought, you know what? God's still speaking. He can speak through all different forms and church denominations and stuff like that. It was just encouraging to me. But let's look at Matthew chapter eight, beginning at verse five. It says this, and when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Don't you love that? When Jesus hears a need, he's moved to action. He says, I wanna respond The Bible says that if we cast our cares on the Lord, he's gonna take care of us, he'll sustain us. One of the the secrets, I believe, of David's life in the Old Testament that needs to be a secret of our life is that we learn how to share our needs with the Lord because he cares for us, he cares deeply for us. God cares more about you than you care about yourself. Think about it. Do you believe that God is committed to your best interest and your well-being? I'm convinced of it. So much so when I start to not love myself well or I don't take care of myself well or I allow garbage in my heart, so to speak, the Lord will address that in my life, not because he's mad at me, but because he loves me. He's like, Scott, I've got better for you than that. Why don't you forgive? Why don't you let go of that? Or whatever it is. In this case, the centurion who was part of the Roman occupation, the occupiers of Israel at that time, he sent a servant. He, 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 he came to Jesus and he said, um, he said, I have a, a, a servant that's lying paralyzed at home and he's fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does this. Verse 10. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. How many of you are familiar with this story I just read? Great story. I love that the centurion, when he comes to Jesus, see the centurion has this understanding that Jesus is a man of authority. The religious leaders struggled with Jesus's authority because Jesus was saying and doing things and and, and the way he, he was teaching and the way he was ministering to people, it was clear that he had authority from heaven. And the centurion recognized Jesus was a man of authority. And he said to Jesus, he said, just say the word. Turn to your neighbor and say, just say the word. And, and to me, it's, it's interesting when I, when I think about this, the centurion, he recognized who he was next to Jesus. He recognized that Jesus had authority from God. He, he may be at this point recognized that Jesus was God. But whatever it was, he knew that Jesus had the ability to do something about his servant's condition whom he cared for. And so he came to Jesus and he said, just say the word. And the Lord, initially he was just willing to go. He was gonna go maybe lay hands on him. Jesus was already postured that way. He says, you don't need to do that. I'm really not worthy. I know who I am compared to you. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but because of the authority that rests on you, would you just say the word and my servant will be healed? This blows Jesus' mind. You know, that's pretty impressive to blow God's mind, right? When he sees that level of faith in action, that level of understanding and revelation that's working in a person's life, it moved Jesus that he made this statement. You know, when I was preparing the message today in that last little part that I talked about, um, where it talked about the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and all that, I almost left that out and my message, and I felt like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some difficult scripture. I wanna share 
It's good to, and easy to read the parts of the Bible that make us feel good and loved and warm and cozy. But what about the verses of the Bible that challenge us sometimes? What about those places that make us a little uncomfortable and like you're like, ooh, that's kind of tough what you just said. But what Jesus was making a point of is there's a, a, an understanding that worked in the centurion that he desired would work in all of his people. And it would be a recognition of God's authority that rests on the life of Jesus. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. As fully God, he has the ability to speak and things happen. You guys, I don't know how many of the older generation here, older than me or my age, you remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials? Do you remember the E.F., what was the, the tagline for the E.F. Hutton commercial? When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen, right? Oh, that when the Lord speaks, we would listen, right? When we, we hear God speak, we would listen to what the Lord's saying. But, but even if we don't listen, it doesn't nullify the fact that God has authority to speak into our situation and change the outcome of what's going on. Many times I'm convinced that the place of prayer is is for us as Christians is coming into this place where we surrender to God. We wrestle in prayer. Jesus wrestled in prayer. We read about this in the Garden of Gethsemane. But this place of saying, God, I, I've got this issue, I've got this need, but your will be done. And just living our lives in a place of surrender to the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. Colossians 1.16 says this, for by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. I love that Colossians highlights the invisible. You guys, there are things that we don't see, but they still exist. Things that we don't perceive, things that we don't fully understand, but it doesn't mean they're not real. It says this, for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, but all things have been created through him and for him. God's our redeemer. He wants to work through even the systems of this world and redeem them ultimately to bring glory and honor to Jesus in and through our lives in the world that we live in. In Hebrews chapter one, beginning at verse one, it says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He is the radiance of, the, of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. Do you remember Jesus in his conversation with one of the disciples, Philip? Philip said, show us the Father. Do you guys remember that passage? And, and Jesus responds to Philip. He says, Philip, don't you know me? You've been with me so long. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. He's talking about the unity that exists, that's present in the Godhead, and also the authority that goes along with that, the, the authority that God has. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the power or by the word of his power. Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Theologians say, uh, some theologians say this, that Moses, when he was 120 years old, he died. And uh, if you talk to people in Jewish culture now and they wish well to another person, one of the phrases they'll, they'll use, they'll go, until 120. And it's this whole idea that God's appointed a certain lifespan for mankind and it's not going to exceed, exceed 120 years. And when Moses died at the end of his life, God brought him up to a mountaintop in, which is now in modern day Jordan that overlooks the Dead Sea. And as you look westward, you can look into the promised land of Israel and ultimately to the Mediterranean Sea. And this Mount Nebo, God brought him up to the mountain and um, God spoke to Moses, said, you're not gonna get to go to the promised land because of the issues that you had in leading my children uh, out. And that's another sermon for another day. But the Bible says that God took Moses home, that Moses died. Some theologians teach that God just spoke to Moses and said, die. 
and Moses died. And that was the end of the game for Moses. It'd be kind of an interesting way to die. The Bible also teaches that God buried Moses somewhere, which is interesting. How would you like the Lord to bury you somewhere one day? <laughs> but, but God sustains and works and does all, thing according, all things according to the word of his power. And, uh, and we, we see this in, in Genesis chapter one. It says in Genesis one, three, then God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. God spoke creation into existence. Isn't that powerful? I mean, who do you know that has that kind of power, that type of authority? I mean, this should blow our minds a little bit. Let there be light, and there was light. Light is still advancing to this day. The speed of light right now is about, it's 186,000 miles per hour is what the, the speed that light travels. And that's very, that's faster than you and I will ever be able to run. And, and God spoke and said, let there be light. And God's word is still being fulfilled. Scientists and astronomers are still realizing that the universes are still expanding at the speed of light. God's word is still being like lived out and, and, and carried on even today from what happened in Genesis chapter one. God spoke and there was. Genesis 1, the Lord said this. God, then God said, let us, who is God talking to? Let us make man, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the unity of the Godhead demonstrated in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God said and it was. God spoke and it happened. Genesis 1, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gave authority to mankind to be fruitful and to multiply. We have uh, six grandchildren and uh, we're kind of amazed because I'm pretty young, right? I mean, you guys think I'm pretty young? Yes, I'm young. I'm 53 years old. I'm the youngest old guy you'll ever meet. And, and we have six grandchildren. And it blows my mind that we have six grandchildren at this season of life that we're in. And we still have three kids still in the nest. So by the time this is all said and done with, we may be a small nation. And yesterday, my wife's grandmother and some family came over for dinner. And I was talking to Rachel's grandmother. And she's an old pioneer. And has lived in Alaska her whole life. And uh, she has, how many grandchildren, Rach? A ton. She has like over 26 grandchildren. I forgot what it was. It's, it's, it's actually way more than that. I'm like, what a huge family. This is like a, and I'm like, you know what? Genesis 128, it's an action. Be fruitful and multiply, right? And, and, and again, the Lord says something. He gives authority and that authority actually translates to change and transformation. It translates to action. One of the, I think, the sad things that sometimes happens in our lives as believers is that the Lord gives us a place of authority and we don't exercise the authority that he's given us. And when that happens, we miss out or we lose out on the privilege of what it means to be a child of God. And so again, talking about the place of prayer in our own personal lives is exercising the authority that God gives us in our lives. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus said this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is a, this is a, a central part of the gospel message that's important for you and I to understand. Jesus was communicating in Matthew 16, that passage I just read, to his disciples, I am giving you delegated authority. You have authority to act and conduct yourself in a certain way that's going to either advance or stymie the work of God in and through your life. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, he says. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. This is a real shift that we need to understand as believers, that we have authority that has been delegated to us. How many of you guys are good at asking other people to help you or you're good at delegating to other people? There's like two of us. The rest of us, you've gotten yourself in trouble because you didn't wanna ask for help 
and maybe it didn't turn out as well as it could have turned out, right? How many of you need help asking for help? I appreciate the humility in the room. And, and, and the Lord, I, I, you know, it's amazing some of the stuff that God entrusts us to, to us, I would say it that way. Um, you know, I, if I were the Lord, I, and I'm not, I don't know if I would do it the way. He trusts people like with a lot of authority. He's delegated a lot of authority to mankind. He's delegated a lot of authority to his church. And, and, and you gotta, gotta ask the question, why? God, why have you given us this authority? Why have you delegated? And, and scripture is clear that the, the pattern of the New Testament, even in the Old Testament, when Adam and Eve named the animals in the garden, when Adam named the animals, it's this idea that God gives delegated authority and his desire is for us to be in this place of, of, of working in partnership with God the way that we live our lives. Scripture, I don't have this passage in my notes today, but it says that we're co-heirs with Christ. We're co-laborers. We work with the Lord, that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And so he gives us delegated authority. Again, in Matthew 18, 18, he says this. He's driving home the point. Truly, I say to you, Jesus is speaking a reminder of what he had said in Matthew 16. Just a couple of chapters later, he says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? What does that mean, that what we bind is bound and what we loose is, is loosed? What do you think... What shapes us? What are, what are some of the primary things that have shaped your life? Um, obviously, we have lots of childhood experiences, the life experiences that form who we are. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not good experiences, areas of our life that maybe need to be redeemed. But I, I think most of you would probably agree with me. Words shape our lives. Words matter. Words matter things that people say to us, the things that we say to other people, the way we say things to other people, the way people say things to us, it affects us greatly. And words, my wife says it this way, our words are containers of power. Our words can have the ability to build up or to tear down. Our words have the ability to bring life or to destroy. And, and Jesus recognized this. The centurion recognized that Jesus' words were life-giving, and he had the ability to do something about the situation that his servant was in. But words are a really big deal. Words reveal character. Words reveal what's going on in your heart. Words reveal what you've been meditating on in your life. And, and there, there needs to be a sense when I share a message like this, even in my own life. I mean, there have been more times than I care to admit or can count where I've said the wrong thing at the wrong time out of the wrong spirit. Has anybody ever, any husbands? Have you, like me, foot and mouth disease, right? You know, your foot doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good either, right, in your mouth. But there's been many times I'm like, oh, man, I wish I hadn't said that. Why? Because I was grieved. I knew that did not help the situation. As a parent, sometimes my wife tries to remind me. She can see what's coming, and I'm about to react or respond in a way to my kids. She's like, she's like, Scott, now's not the time. Now's not the time. Let's pray about this first. Don't, let's not make things worse with our words. I've had times in my life where I've actually like really been dialed into this, and I've, I've really prayed sincerely, and I've asked the Lord, God, would you please guide my speech? I've been putting my foot in my mouth a lot lately. Would you please help me? I was loosing something, loosening something that wasn't helping my family or wasn't helping the relationships that were in my life. Now, sometimes we need to say tough things. Sometimes we need to have tough conversations and people may not like what we have to say. But even in then, in that context, scripture teaches us to speak the truth in love, right? Paul warns in Galatians that if you have to correct someone, don't be harsh in the way that you correct another person. Why? Because words matter. The way we use our words matter. It's important. In Matthew 21, 21, Jesus said this. And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, 
you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. That's a lot of authority. That's a lot of something that we can do about the problems and obstacles that we face in our life with the way that we use our words. Just say the word, Lord. When we pray or when we speak, we want to be able to speak and respond out of a place that's going to help solve the problem. I believe one of the primary practical points of why the Lord gives the church the Holy Spirit is to solve problems, to help meet needs, to help bring greater understanding and fix situations. If you look at the Gospels and, and, and how Jesus went around doing good, healing the sick, setting those who are oppressed by the devil f free, he was solving problems in people's lives. There were problems that needed to be addressed. Jesus wasn't ignoring problems. He was doing something to bring transformation. The gospel message brings transformation. The gospel changes things. How many of you are changed because of the gospel? You're not the person you used to be because the word of God works. God spoke a word and your life is being transformed even now. And so what do we do with this mouth of ours? James chapter three says this, beginning in verse one. There's some accountability for those who teach the Bible. It says this, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as, as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. That when I read that, as a guy gets up almost every week and I preach the Bible, and I do my best, I am accountable for the way I handle the message. I'm, ultimately, I'm accountable to God for that. So again, that's a matter of how I use my words. If I use my words and the way I teach in a way that's bringing honor to God or is it causing confusion? Or worse, is it leading someone actually away from the Lord? Verse two, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. Our tongue is likened to a rudder. What does a rudder do? It steers a ship. And the course of our ship God has a, a preferred plan for our lives and the direction that our life is supposed to take. And if our, our tongue, the words of our mouth, are not surrendered and yielded to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the ship of our life can take a turn in the wrong direction and we could become shipwrecked. We don't wanna be shipwrecked. We want our speech to be fruitful in our lives. The centurion says, just say the word. He knew enough about Jesus. He knew that Jesus' speech was fruitful, that it brought about transformation. Second half of verse five. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. What does that mean? Just in the same sense that God wants to speak and use our tongue for noble purposes, Satan wants to use our tongue and inspire our speech for his purposes. The power of life and death is in the, is in the tongue. So when I share a message like this, it's, it's, it's probably just let it be a friendly reminder that our words matter. Let it be a friendly reminder that there's a way that we can speak and a way that we can live our lives that's going to be more fruitful than other ways. It says this, for every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. Verse eight, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, verse nine, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. I have done that. Has anybody here done that? I, I stand up in a Sunday morning service, I sit on the front row and I raise my hands and I'm blessing God. 
And Sunday afternoon, I can be talking smack about my neighbor. Has anybody been there? Does this not, when we read these passages, doesn't this put you like a little bit like, ugh, I need to be careful in what I say. Even as we go into this political season, let's remember we're accountable to God for our words and the way that we speak. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine, tree, vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. You guys, there's a benefit, I believe, that the Lord wants us to experience in our lives through our confession, through the way that we speak, the way that we use our words. Do we use our words to bless or do we use our words to curse? And the Bible says those who love it, who understand, who have this revelation that the power of life and death are in the tongue, those who love it will eat its fruit. The benefit, I, the last couple of days I haven't been feeling well. I was in church last night praying just before the service. And I'm like, Lord, there is no reason for me to be sick right now. It doesn't make sense. I don't have time for this. I, how many of you, you turn into a big baby when you get sick? Anybody? <laughs> yes, I, I, me too, Noah. I'm with you. And, and I'm like, and I'm just like, and I'm, I'm like, I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be sick. And I'm going to do whatever I can so I don't have to be sick anymore. So I'm taking vitamin C and I'm drinking plenty of water and doing all the stuff that I should do. And then, and I just was praying and I'm like, I'm in the name of Jesus. I'm rebuking the sickness. I'm using the word that, words that God gave me. I'm just, it's a little bug. I'm not dying, don't worry. But, and, and, and just those things. And last night I went back to the house after I prayed here in the sanctuary for a little bit and I was getting ready for bed. And I said, Rachel, can we pray? And we just prayed over one another last night. And, uh, and I took my medicine, I took my Advil or whatever it was I took, Theraflu, whatever. And then I got up this morning and after a couple of days of not feeling good, I felt better this morning. And I thought the power of life and death is in the tongue. Sometimes we tolerate things in our life unnecessarily and we just don't do anything about it when we have authority to do something about it. God, I believe God still heals people today. Does anybody believe that? I believe, that I, now I know when I say stuff like that, sometimes the tendency of our mind is, well, what about this person? Or what about this situation? And I don't have the answer. And I'm not gonna try to give you an answer to something that I can't explain. I do know that I have the Bible and I know that God says he watches over his word to perform it. And so I'm gonna stand on God's word. I would rather die in a place of faith and trusting and believing God than not have faith at all. And that's important for us. The early church got a revelation of this and they understood that they too could speak the word. They had spent time with Jesus and they understood that Jesus had given them delegated authority and that when opportunity presented itself and the need arose, that they exercised the authority that God had given them to speak the word. In Acts chapter three, verse six, this is after the day of Pentecost, but Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. The rest of that story is that a man who had been lame got up and walked. He understood, Peter understood that he had authority and he began to step out and exercise that authority and he saw the fruit of it and he enjoyed it. It's good when God answers prayer. I think sometimes we, you know, how many of you grew up in church culture? Sunday night was like testimony night at church. Do you remember that? And the pastor would take a risk and he would open up the microphone to the congregation and people would come up and share stories. And somebody inevitably would come up and try to preach and the pastor would be like, this is not what this is about. But if God's done something in your life, would you wanna give him glory and share your testimony as a means of encouraging other people? And when we hear that, it provokes us, it stirs us. Well, God did that for them. Maybe he'll do that for me too or whatever, whatever it may be. In Psalm 19, 14, it says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I think it's so easy to read through these passages in the Bible and not take time 
to just park there and even pray the scripture as we look at this. When I'm struggling, and I know there's a struggle inside of me at times, and I realize Satan is trying to win right now. He's trying to get me. He's trying to get my goat in this situation. I'll go back to Psalm 19. Lord, you know what's, what, what's stirring on the inside of me right now, but I want to resubmit what's going on in my internal life to your lordship, and I want the words of my mouth, and I, even more importantly than the words of my mouth, it's what's going on in my heart. I want the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. Knowing that God knows what I'm thinking about, knowing that God knows and sees what I'm meditating on, sobers me. It kind of helps me. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the starting point. It's the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have the fear of the Lord working in your life, you're not walking in wisdom. But if the fear of the Lord operates in your life and you realize God sees everything, he knows everything, and I am accountable to God for the way that I live my life, it will curb some of our bad habits. How many of you have bad habits that need to be curbed in your life, right? And, and, and so the fear of the Lord teaches us to say no to ungodliness, even in our speaking in the words that we say. Do not give yourself permission to say, I can go ahead and use my mouth in an inappropriate way and it's all covered by God's grace. That is taking the grace of God in vain in your life. Don't do it. It's not healthy. It's, it's, it's gonna lead you down a bad path in your life. So let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in God's sight. Jesus, say the word. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, when he began his public ministry, and Satan was tempting him at every turn. He went through this great temptation in the wilderness. Every time Satan tempted him, Jesus responded with the scripture. He responded with the word. This is why it's important for us, and I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are at church on Sunday morning. But let's fill our lives with God's word so that when the enemy throws his darts at us, that we have a leg to stand on and we have an arsenal of scripture that the Holy Spirit can draw from, that we can use to speak to the storms of our lives or to bring a word of encouragement in due season. Rachel, can I put you on the spot? Oh my goodness. That's what happens when you're married to the pastor. I love you, sweetheart. What's the setting? What's, what's the word like apples of gold? What's it? Can you say it? Somebody, okay, like apples of gold. In settings, in settings of silver is a word aptly spoken. God wants our words to be that way, like apples of gold in settings of silver. In settings of silver is a word aptly spoken. I think what I'd like to do right now, um, we have a few minutes, just in the quietness of your own heart, right now in your seat before the Lord. And we'll just take a moment I want to encourage you to, to bring this area of speech in your life before the Lord. And if you have been off base in the way you've communicated, just ask the Lord, God, forgive me. I, I don't want this in my life. In, in a fresh way, just ask the Lord to guide your speech, that it would be productive and life-giving in your life. Let's just take a moment, just you and the Lord right now, just quietly.
there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. But Lord, you have a way that you want us to walk. You have a way that you want us to live our lives. You have a way you want us to use our words. And Lord, you want us to experience the joy and the benefit of using our words in the right way to see problems solved, to see relationships healed, to see lives changed, to see atmospheres affected. Lord, I ask that you would help all of us to understand that you have called us and created us to be a conduit that you work through in our world. You called us the salt of the earth. We want to be the salt of the earth. Lord, to our coworkers, our family members, Lord, we want to be the salt of the earth. Lord, we want to represent you well. And so, Lord, as the psalmist prayed, we pray and we ask you that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. Lord, would you teach us and help us to understand in a practical way the delegated authority that you've given to us, Lord, that we would, we would uh, be in alignment? And just what does it mean? Why did you give us this delegated authority? And, and really help us to learn and to understand it better, God. And Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for your great love for everyone in this room. And uh, Lord, I, I just thank you. I, I pray that, God, you would, in this week, you would work in and through their lives in such a way that they would see and be convinced in a personal way that you are working and you are moving and you are leading them and you are involved in the circumstances of their lives. Lord, for those that are facing conflict, Lord, right now, maybe relational conflict, conflict at work, Lord, I ask that you would give them grace, Lord, to be able to navigate conflict in a productive way that bears fruit, Lord. And uh, even in the face of challenging circumstances, I ask that you would strengthen them, Lord, to stand on your word, strengthen them, Lord, that they would be able to respond in a right way, even in the face of difficulty, even in the face of maybe people saying things to them or about them, that are less than loving. God, help them, Lord, to love well and to respond well in these situations. Lord, I ask you to bless your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're gonna, I, we're gonna end service now, but if you'd like prayer, we got a group of people, we'd love to pray for you. Um, and we just want you to know you're loved and uh, we want you to have a good day. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you guys midweek. Uh, if you're able to make it out. If not, we'll see you next Sunday's Family Sunday, which is my favorite Sunday of the month. So we'll have a potluck. So bring a dish to share. We're going to have fun. The kids will be joining us upstairs. Uh, we're going to mix it up just a little bit next week. I, I think it's going to be fun. You're going to enjoy it. So it's, it's Family Sunday is a good time to bring a guest to church and because uh, we get to hang out and eat afterwards and and uh, get to know each other just a little bit better. We're also gonna be rolling out some new ministry for the fall as well. So you don't wanna miss that. So Lord bless you, have a great week. Go in the encouragement and favor of God. God bless you.